Hello. I'm here today to suggest another way of looking at the world, and that's through the library. Now, not library in the sense of book collection, but a store of knowledge or of experience. Now, we should define our terms. For something to be a library, it needs the following. It needs to be categorized in some way. Parts of the library need to disagree with or relate to one another. The curator can't fully understand it. It needs to be constantly changing, and it needs to cater to at least one specialization. Now, you'll notice that the stock definition of library doesn't contain any of those stipulations, which is why I believe it's wrong. Uh, we currently just think of a library as a stock of pieces organized according to some system, like a Dewey Decimal number, or maybe the size of the thing, the year it was made, whatever. Uh, physically, the items are placed in sequence in regards to some aspect of what they are. But nothing about that definition takes into account the context around it. The label, quote-unquote, library, can be applied to an art gallery, it can be applied to a collection of objects like porcelain, frogs, or stamps, just about anything. As it stands, only the human experience is what separates a library from a collection. Now, you take, for example, the video store restoration project undertaken by James Rolfe, who you might know as the angry video game nerd. He's got this project where he's tried to preserve the aesthetic of video rental stores from the early 90s. He's converted a chunk of his house into a replica of a video store, complete with posters, promotional flyers, shelves organized by genre, wooden paneling, and even a small TV set in the corner. It's pretty impressive and it's fairly interesting. Why is this important? Well, it's crucial to my argument because Rolf hasn't watched every video he owns and he doesn't understand every detail of the ones that he has watched. This, more than anything, makes Rolf's VHS collection a library instead. A library is a place of learning, where some of the work inside is recognizable and some is absolutely unknown. We're stepping into ironically familiar territory with this, into Umberto Eco's anti-library, where he never read everything that he owned, and all of the stuff he never read stared down at the top of his head in his study, almost in a threatening way. Now, the anti-library is the only kind of real library, because a collection of books that lack a mystery is just a collection. And a collection implies uniformity in style and substance and outlook. Okay, so what's wrong with that? Nothing in and of itself, but it does lead to the following observations. Every book in a library references another. Every book is connected by at least one tenuous thing to another, and a lot of them make large spidery webs of references. Occasionally, they'll disagree with one another. That's the ideal. Fights will happen in any good library. Contradictions. I don't mean exclusively in the literature, as in book A says book B is wrong and book C says that book B is also wrong. I mean, if you own two separate films about Dracula that present him wildly differently, that's a kind of argument as well. You can synthesize both Draculas as a result, and it results in a deeper understanding of Dracula in your library, just as an example. A library needs a curator who hasn't read every book in it. This not only prevents that curator from getting a swelled head, but it also physically imposes on that person the reality that not everything fits into their model of the world by literally presenting them with constant proof of the fact. All of the books that are staring down at the top of his head in his study are telling him, we know stuff you don't, and he's got no choice but to understand that. So, this man has one foot in safety and one foot stepping into the unknown, and he's constantly, ideally, he's constantly reading and exploring. Uniformity and having all of the books in the library read by the curator results in a sort of system where this person thinks that they can explain the whole world away just with what they already know, which is, of course, wrong, and that's not how libraries work. So the library, by necessity, needs to be consistently growing, because if that weren't the case, the curator would finish it. Uh, it only takes a matter of time before we end up with Borges' Library of Babel, where every possible computation of 25 characters plus period and comma are combined in an infinite library. Luckily, we'll die before that happens. I do think, as a side note, uh, it would be interesting to see a VHS or a video game library of Babel where every possible combination of data is entered onto an unlimited number of tapes, discs, cartridges, in a lot of different file formats. It'd be just like the text version, you know? Mostly nothing, and 
the occasional hint of a game or a screenshot of an unrecognizable film, but inside that library would be every possible film or game or book or piece of music that could potentially exist. And that is one thing that differentiates a library from a collection, the fact that the library can't be finished. It's permanent but liquid. It can't be fully understood or catalogued. Until it's destroyed or broken up, it's a work in progress. So you might ask, why do I really care about the distinction between library and collection? And the main issue that I have with collecting anything is that if something were important enough for you to consider it important, the object that housed it becomes nothing more than a reference tool. Memory and understanding and the desire for understanding is more important. So collecting something, which by the way, it's very easy for collection to become a sort of symbolic act without the symbolism, in other words, a capitalistic act where you just buy things or have things for the sake of having them. But we're not really talking about that right now. It is a factor though. In any case, if you considered something really memorable or important, the fact of actually owning it would be less important. If it were worth your time, you'd remember it. And since memory is a creative act, you could stimmy your own creative process if you were, recall, if you were to recall everything too clearly. If we take the Borges story of Funes the Memorius, where the man with the eidetic memory is cursed by both being uncreative and knowing that cataloguing all of his memories would take as long as experiencing them again, since he remembers every single detail he perceives, that is kind of the logical end point of that idea. Stimulus causes Funes the Memorius pain, in a sense. Now obviously that's not really possible for us, but it is a story after all, so it has to sort of go beyond the real. You understand what I mean. In creating the game Dark Souls, director Hidetaka Miyazaki noted that his experience in playing the game was designed with his childhood memory in mind. He read books in English that he barely understood, and he was forced to exercise creativity in filling the gaps by himself. Funes the Memorius is unable to do that, so he's missing out on a fairly essential part of the human experience. There's something else that Borges said that I want to just quickly get out before we move on, and that is that a misquote can often be more interesting the, than the original, not least because it can be compared and contrasted to note the difference, or, as Borges would say, ah, my memory has improved it. So, what I've been trying and kind of failing to get around to saying in the past few minutes is the following. If you read something and you forgot it, or if it made no personal impact, you've wasted your time. On the same level, if something really impacted you, you don't need to preserve it with photography or keep it on a shelf because you'll remember it organically. With individual context as well, the book's smell, the way, the where, the place you read it, etc, etc, everything about the thing helps you remember it. A digital library doesn't have all of those elements. Everything in a digital library is sorted in the same couple of ways. They're all according to strict always accurate, completely unforgettable, unimpeachable rules. The grime, the dirt, the unremarkable qualities of a work that still make it unique will disappear. All subjectivity on the matter will be lost. It will be viewed from a historical perspective, as a classic. I'm going to talk about the Italian publisher Roberto Calasso now. In his work, The Art of the Publisher, he railed against the concept of the fully indexed library. The argument goes, things should be allowed to be lost. Because, as every horror analyst tells us, the possibility is more exciting than what exists. Combining books into one giant digital file removes an element of what they are, their covers, their context, their paratext, the fact that they're hard to find, which makes them more interesting, at least to me. To go back to Borges for a second, this is what he was hinting at in Funes the Memorias, and even more so in The Immortals. Essentially, forgetting is our greatest ability, and it's the thing we should treasure above everything else. Because it's not just forgetting, it's, it's synonymous with filtering. A digital library isn't a library by virtue of it being digital. And just to bring us back to a more secular concern, a less abstract concern, for a second, you don't actually own it iTunes and Amazon allow users to purchase a license to play the data, not to own a copy of it. Now, I'm not a Luddite, and I've used those services quite a bit in the past, but it annoys me anyway. And that kind of brings us to the library of the modern world. I apologize for the following baby boomer tier generalization. 
The world is just too large nowadays. Now, that's not because it's necessarily grown any bigger, but it's because it's turned inward on itself. The amount of total discussion on any one given topic is now insurmountably massive because of the internet, where before there would have been a couple of specialist books or even maybe a handful of experts to wax on any given obscure topic, there are now legions of people engaged in constant dialogue, and everything that was famous before is now ultra-famous. Now that much is pretty obvious, the following, I think, is less so. The ability to share anything at any time, whenever you want, creates the following problem and a thousand variations on this problem. Say a young person has a copy of Ivan Turgenev's Fathers and Sons on his bookshelf. Now, this person doesn't necessarily have any interest in Turgenev or of Russian literature in general. Their bookshelf has one Russian novel, surrounded by American and English novels. It's got nothing to do with their field of study or their purview at all. Now, what is this person getting out of Turgenev? This person didn't know who Turgenev was until five minutes ago. He or she was told that he was a classic author and had to be read, and so there Turgenev sits on the shelf alongside Tool and Tolkien. He, or she, only bought Fathers and Sons because it was featured on a quote-unquote best books of all time list in some two-bit newspaper roundup. The sheer number of best-of lists for books which proclaim the titles of the most obvious classics alongside books that have taken pop culture by storm for one reason or another has multiplied beyond belief. And of course, the lists always have the same nonsensical selection of English and American classics. I say nonsensical because they've got nothing to do with each other. What does the USA Trilogy by John Dos Passos have to do with War and Peace? What is the relation between Don Quixote and Bleak House? Now look, they're not bad books, of course, no way, but they lie in completely different fields of study, they come from completely different contexts, comparing them is not something to be done lightly in a throwaway list made in five minutes by some guy in BuzzFeed with a cheap numerical grade attached. It's something to be done with purpose with a hypothesis that relates the two together, that justifies them being mentioned in the same sentence. Now, you add this hodgepodge placement of repetitively touted Anglo-American classics to a list over and over again. They only become more popular and more likely to end up on shelves that have nothing to do with them, with no understanding on the curator's part. A good library's books all have some relation to one another, but this relation's often twisted or illogical, maybe it relies on a twin equivalence mentioned in a third book, written itself for another field of study entirely. A good library is a game of shifting webs. Let's pare that down further. A library is a conspiracy. A bad library is one made entirely of recommendations from others, with no individual choice put into it, containing nothing but your top 100 classics type books. Now, the fact that the same types of books appear on these top 100 lists all the time may serve as a testament to their quality, but it's also, perhaps in some cases more so, a testament to their quality and capacity as memes. That may seem obvious, but there's a layer of depth to this statement that I think should be explained. We're going to talk about the Pareto distribution for a bit. If you know what that is, you might want to skip a few minutes. But for those of you who don't know, the Pareto distribution is a social sciences theory. Colloquially, it's known as the 80-20 rule, where 20% of the population owns about 80% of the wealth, and 20% of the top 20% receive 80% of that wealth, and so on and so on ad infinitum. Now, you can apply that to sales of books pretty easily, because Harry Potter outsells every other book that exists except the Bible. J.K. Rowling and Stephen King basically have 99% of all royalties ever earned by the profession of actually writing books, and all of the other authors to ever live share the remaining 1%. Now, this is related to another theory called the Matthew Effect. This is the Matthew Effect, so named for a quote from Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount. Credit is ascribed to the famous, making them more famous. People who are ignored stay that way. When Harry Potter sells a million copies, it'll probably sell two million more because it can now boast about the fact that it's sold a million copies and because so many people who've read it are telling other people to read it that the capacity for growth grows alongside the product itself. So, to bring this tangent back to its beginning, discussion of a given book on the internet exponentially multiplies because the criticism and discussion propagate among themselves, thank you Matthew, and the more of it exists, the more Google takes note of it and pushes it to the front page, which means more people notice it, which means Google pushes it further up the front page, so on and so on. You understand.
everything becomes a giant feedback loop of plugging and praise for one particular book, and the result is that some clueless young person buys a copy of Turgenev's Fathers and Sons, and they put it next to Tool and Tolkien on their bookshelf of entry-level classics, and they never read it, because it's not got anything to do with anything they've ever encountered or plan to encounter. But they were told it was good by hundreds of sources over a very long period of time, so they eventually caved and bought it. Now, where does this leave someone who wants a specialization or a critic? Well, actually, it leaves us in a pretty simple position. Talk about obscure quality content. This is why you shouldn't talk about things that are popular already, because there's no point. Why review crime and punishment for the millionth time, when so much more articulate analysis has already been conducted on it? Rather, it should be our job at the moment to focus on obscurities, because that's how they're raised from their sorry state to become classics. To Kill a Mockingbird shows up in every best books ever list, and The Murderess by Alexandros Papadiamandis shows up in none of them. Now, that's not necessarily a bad thing. It's a separate discussion, but it should be changed. Because the internet can easily become a boon rather than an ad machine shilling the next Harry Potter novel. With the internet, you can dig up an expert on anything. Just convince that expert to talk about what he or she is an expert in. Get him or her to jump down that deepest rabbit hole, whichever rabbit hole they can find, and report back, because what they find will be interesting. What they'll find, in fact, is what I call a fetish. We'll talk about fetishes for a while. Please don't misunderstand what I mean by this word. Having a fetish is essential for survival. Let's define our terms quick before someone decides to search my hard drive or call the police. I'm not talking about a sexual fetish, for God's sake. In a sentence, we'll say a fetish is a specialization undertaken for its own sake, a private interest, not reliant on anyone else sharing it for it to interest you, that serves as a framework through which you interpret the world. Or, let's call it a motivating framework. Take, as an example, a man with a great interest in games, who interprets changes in his life as the movement of pieces on an allegorical board. Or a guy into literature, who characterizes his life according to the monomyth. A doctor who consciously or not views people in terms of their illnesses. A chef who views the world as split by what people eat and how they eat it rather than by national boundaries. Applied to a work of art, a fetish is what makes this work different from another work, its sort of specific focus. Personally, what I call good art typically has a clear unique fetish while bad art is generic and lacks one, but that's a debate for another time. An artist can't lack a fetish, in the sense that every artist is chasing an archetypal version of themselves, Problems in that area arise when they try to copy other people instead of following their own potential or their own fetish. There are a lot of 20-something-year-old, slightly bright types who'd like to become unique. So they look for all the unique books, and they read them, and they sometimes pretend to read them, and they all become alike. But you can't do that, or you'll fall into the trap of never having fun with it. It won't become a compulsion to be the best you can, but a compulsion to be the best version of whatever that archetype is that can never be achieved because it's an archetype. And since it's an archetype of someone who's essentially incomplete, you don't want to become that anyway. It's never finished. It never achieves what the Olympian gods would have thought of as teleosis. You have to chase the archetype of yourself instead. You have to chase your own fetish, in other words, not somebody else's. So we'll go back to a more general view of the fetish. We should examine its actual meaning just for a second. So... Taking a look at that word, independent of the modern and exclusively sexual meaning, reminds us of a religious idol, one of those wooden figures that used to be worshipped by West African tribesmen, and they believed contained gods. While that might seem incongruous with the above explanation, I think it fits quite well. A god, a supreme being, is the filter through which the hypothetical man interprets the world. And there's no reason to discount that old definition in light of the new either, since a fetish and a god are the same. They've got the key to meaning, a solid bedrock, an unquestionable foundation through which to interpret the world. In the traditional sense, it was unquestionable due to superstition, certainly, but now it's unquestionable as a result of the time put into it, hours of understanding gained from a lifetime of experience. A fetish, any fetish, contains its own minuscule and gargantuan world within the area of just one art form or of one profession is a universe full of specialist terms, of ideas, a personal history relative to the history of everything outside of it, which might actually contradict another fetish's history. You think of art history, which is mostly kind of peaceful trade versus the history of conquest. People don't often understand what they like. 
They hear Claire de Lune on the radio, and they assume they enjoy classical music. And then they hear Schoenberg, and they get bored in seconds, despite it ostensibly, through their lens, being the same thing. They define classical music as music played by non-rock instruments. Meanwhile, somebody with a fetish for formal written music would immediately assert the difference between 20th century modernist music and French Impressionism, and they would understand both of those things in some detail. This results in a great deal of disappointment when fetishists try to introduce their interests to somebody else, as demonstrated by the following generic and yet oft-cited exchange. A says, I enjoy all music except a rap and country. B says, oh, that's excellent, try this. He then proceeds to play death metal. A says, oh no, I don't like this. This exchange is repeated ad nauseum until nothing remains but indie rock. Now, what A ought to have said was, I enjoy indie music, and I can tell you about the little universe of indie rock, but nothing else. But there was no way for B to know how little they knew, because they didn't follow the fetish far enough. Ask a 21st century atheist what God is, and he'll reply with some dismissive answer about a primitive, psychologically driven superstition, and a protective, idealized sky daddy. None of the terms of religion, or the practices thereof, have any meaning for him. Now, you ask a 12th century Frenchman what God is, and he'll tell you that God is the underlying reason for everything, and the existence of his God is what allows him to define everything, understand abstract events. He can look at an assortment of religious tools, symbols, icons. He can understand how they all fit into the overarching tapestry of Christian faith. He knows what each piece means, and what it's used for, and why. In other words, for the guy who believes, the guy with the fetish, Somewhat arbitrary-seeming practices have their own meaning, and they map onto the world in a very specific way. To use a more secular example, you might say a chess player understands the reason every piece moves the way it does, and that's of course because it corresponds to a medieval fighter, and a doctor would understand his tools better than a layman. So the Frenchman can look at the crucifixion, and he can see it as something more than a Jewish rebel being strung on a cross in some backwater Roman province. He can view it as the supreme moment of salvation for all of mankind, because he understands the underlying meaning of Jesus being the Son of God, and he's using that fetishistic understanding to interpret the event, where a 21st century atheist wouldn't. This is what I mean, in part, when I say the history of a fetishist and of a normal person, or rather a person with a different fetish unrelated to that event in question, because there's no such thing as a normal person, are different. Whoever lacks a fetish, lacks meaning. All aspects of life assume an equally important, agnostic, characterless character, and the, the observer becomes this post-modern nightmare zombie with only a casual interest in everything, unable to decide anything's more important than anything else. So what happens then? Well, Apart from them being unspeakably boring to talk to, they never become better at anything in particular than anyone else. Try this hot take on for size. Someone with a fetish for terrible, schlocky science fiction from the 1980s has a better understanding of life in general than somebody with a scattered interest in reading tons of classical, classical literature with no specific focus. The former's delved deep enough into something, it doesn't matter what it is, that he's gained an understanding of the difference between things that appear to be the same. The latter person has spread himself thin and through a wide and shallow experience, and he hasn't comprehended that difference. This is the essence of a fetish, or rather this is how you know you've got a fetish, when you can tell the difference between things that laymen would assume were identical or at least similar. A fetish is also the basis for empathy, because of how people characterize one another as non-entities unless they've got direct experience with them. Fetishism allows one to notice the minute differences in what may appear identical, to pick a face out from a crowd. In that sense, you could say that an especially empathetic person had a fetish for people. So, to reiterate, to return to our original topic, and to conclude, Samuel P. Huntington, the 20th century American political scientist, coined the phrase clash of civilizations to describe how people in different tribes interacted throughout history. History, however, is not a clash of civilizations, but a clash of fetishes, a progression of our race on the individual level. Even when applied to kings and presidents, the fixation is what drives history. The fixations of millions create social movements, the fixation of important leaders change each other's minds, and so on and so on. Investing in a fetish, a body of knowledge, a library, a store of experience, they're all the same thing, is necessary in order to live alongside rather than below the people around you, in order to rise above the level of philosophical zombie, to become a human being by investing in the activity of a human being, an intense and almost arbitrary, a meaningful focus.
So to reiterate, a library is something you need to exist in the world. It needs these characteristics. It has to be categorized in some way. Parts of it need to agree or disagree with one another. The curator can't fully understand it until it's destroyed or it finishes. It needs to constantly grow or change, and it needs to cater to at least one fetish in order to understand the world through that lens. So what is a library? And what is a store of memory, experience, knowledge? We are each a conspiracy and a fetish.